Good evening. Deadlock and despair in Copenhagen as the summit which promised so much looks like delivering so little. The United States says President Obama has reached agreement with the leaders of China, India, Brazil and South Africa on monitoring greenhouse gas emissions. However, the EU has still not signed up to the deal and there's uncertainty about what it all means. Our science editor Susan Watts joins us live from Copenhagen. Susan. Well, in the last hour, it's become clear that there is a deal. The US, China, India, Brazil and South Africa have signed up, but Europe is still talking. They're not yet signed up to this deal. This is how the day unfolded. Copenhagen is waking up to a day that's supposed to go down in history. 120 or so world leaders are gathered here in one building to try to forge a deal on cutting global greenhouse gas emissions. Outside, some have already given up. Why are you shaving your head this morning? We want to express our strong emotions, our strong disbelief about what is going on in the last days here in Copenhagen. They don't even try to, to do a fair and binding outcome of this conference. World leaders recognise that the longer they delay, the harder and more expensive it'll be to keep emissions down, below the point where scientists say the world faces catastrophic climate change. But can they make a deal today? You again? President Obama's arrival was supposed to inject some fresh energy, and there's a lot of work to do. Ministers talked throughout last night, and there was very little progress. His message was that America was ready to do a deal. Ladies and gentlemen, there's no time to waste. America's made our choice. We have charted our course. We have made our commitments. We will do what we say. Now I believe it's the time for the nations and the people of the world to come together behind a common purpose. We are ready to get this done today. But this was met by accusations by some southern countries that President Obama was here to do a backroom deal. Uh, behind everyone's back in an anti-democratic way cooks up a document. Cooks up a document that we don't accept and we will not accept. We will never accept it. And it wasn't long before that document emerged. I was given an early version of the Copenhagen text at noon and by two o'clock we had a version with numbers on cuts in emissions and hopeful sounding wording about a deadline for a legally binding treaty. By four o'clock most of the numbers had gone, leaving only an aspiration to reduce global emissions by 50% in 2050 below 1990 levels and nothing on a deadline for a legally binding outcome. By mid-afternoon, 20 or so key countries were ensconced in a crunch meeting, as everyone else waited. I just bumped into the second in command for the US negotiating team. I'd overheard him say, my impression is we don't have a deal. I asked him about rumors that three key South American leaders are about to leave. He said, do I care? We can do a deal without them in the room. We're still, we're still working hard. There are still very difficult issues to overcome. Uh, I don't know if we will overcome them, but uh, we're going to give it everything we've got. As later versions of the document emerged, all around the conference centre, people were shaking their heads with disbelief. What seemed initially in this morning when the Danes first introduced this text would be a legally binding text that they would go to the conference of the parties and people would agree on. Slowly over the afternoon, it's changed into a political declaration. Our analysis is, is it's largely greenwashed now. And what we're seeing here is a desperate attempt by leaders to be able to say they achieved something in Copenhagen. Because what's in this content here doesn't do anything to tackle the real issues about the emissions cuts, particularly from rich Annex 1 countries, the level of cuts that are needed, 40% without offsets, the finance that's needed for developing countries to be able to deal with the impacts of, of climate change. So, uh, really, if I was summing it up, I'd say this really isn't worth the paper it's written on. As the day wore on, it became clear that the Americans and the Chinese were stuck. 
It's now just after 7 o'clock and President Obama is supposed to have left by now. In fact, he's in a head-to-head -head with President Wen Jiabao of China. They're trying to resolve a key sticking point, and that is how they check out whether each other is making the emissions reductions they promise. If they don't resolve this issue, there could be no deal. By now, it was becoming clear that the Chinese were playing hardball. They would not sign up to a global target of 50 percent by 2050 unless the developed world agreed to earlier cuts. Some were briefing that the Chinese were manipulating the process in a cynical way. At a quarter to ten Danish time, the dramatic news emerged. There was a deal, but Europe wasn't party to it. Well, Susan's still with us. And before I come back to you, Susan, uh, news that apparently uh, the Prime Minister uh, tweeted on Twitter just before the deal was announced uh, at Copenhagen. He said it's been an exhausting day, but we're almost there. Susan, almost there with what? What does the deal actually say? Well, this is uh, the seven-page agreement. It's called the Copenhagen Accord. Um, it's got, uh, it's recognizes this, it recognizes the scientific view that the global increase in temperature should be below 2 degrees C. There is a line about short-term finance, $30 billion, but crucially, there's nothing in here on cuts in emissions. There's nothing in here on a legally binding treaty. And one commentator said to me that if the EU, the European Union, does sign up to this, it will have caved in to US and Chinese stitch-up. Um, you see, that's been one reaction. What other reaction have you heard? Well, uh, there's very strong emotion uh, here in reaction to this. Uh, one seasoned observer said to me that this is bad for the world. He said the EU's been screwed. He said South Africa, which has signed up, is one of the most vulnerable countries likely to see the effects of, very, of, of the worst effects of climate change. He says they've, they've signed up, they're going to fry, and they'll deserve it. And Susan, we'll probably hear from you later on, but I'm now joined in the studio by a rather annoyed John Prescott, who's fresh off the plane from Copenhagen, where he was pushing uh, for an ambitious deal, uh, as the Council of Europe said, by, and also by our economics editor, Paul Mason. Uh, first of all, to what little we actually know, what's your reaction? Well, that's the point, what little we know Well, we know moment. you weren't there. The but EU wasn't there, not you. But the EU wasn't there. Well, we're, uh, we're still going on in the negotiations, uh, I understand it, particularly when you talk about the emission cuts. What we have got is an e-currents fund. There was never going to be a legal agreement. That's managing expectation. And you've got the fund, you've got some emissions. We're waiting for the details of that. But it is a major step forward from Kyoto. But uh, you say it's a major step forward. You were on this programme hoping there were going to be great things from Copenhagen. And, in fact, it's delivered nothing except a face Don't say deal. nothing. How can you say that? First of right. all, you asked me the legal... Wait a minute. The negotiations haven't finished. We don't know the full details. You always jump, or the journalists too. It's a wipe-off. You're quite wrong. Paul Mason. Let's just remember what this is designed to do. It's designed so that we can have verifiable limits on carbon emissions that then create a price for carbon. That's currently $12 a tonne. The International Energy Authority says it needs to be, by 2020, $50 a tonne and $110 a tonne by 2030. Why? So that... We talk a lot about this 100 billion that they're trying to put aside so that the developing world makes the transition. The real figure we need to focus on is the one trillion dollars a year that needs to be invested by business, not government. So they to won't make invest the, it without a proper deal. The, to make the, the businesses invest, they need certainty. And you have to judge this treaty, whatever it is, this agreement, against certainty. And I can't see from these very early reports any move towards certainty. Paul, there will be new, as we did with Kyoto. We didn't have a legal agreement, we had the principles. The second one was in the protocol, you went to negotiate what these details were. We've already said there's a meeting in Bonn in six months' time. There'll be the COP that takes place in November in Mexico. That's what happened at Kyoto. You have a statement of the principles and you work out the details. Well, we can be joined now by our other guests for In Washington.